Amen, amen, and amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much. I was blessed. I like that medley, Lucas. Thanks for doing that. I really did enjoy that. It was a real blessing. All right, let me get, get all plugged up here. And we'll get started, all right? Now, I'm going to... Um, I'm talking to my AV people real quick, all right? I'm, I'm going to change the play from the line of scrimmage, all right? Do it a little differently than we did in the huddle. So uh, and I'll show the, the video in a moment, but instead I'm going to bring my friend up, Leo, first, all right? So come on up here, Leo. If you don't know Leo, I am, I am very sorry that you don't know Leo because you're missing out on a treasure in life. Amen? Amen. Amen. And... Uh, let me see if I can get your mic going on here, Leo. There we go. So this gentleman here, Leo Ranzlin, <laughs> is uh, someone that I can truly, with, with utmost sincerity, say that my life is better knowing him. Amen. He's always got a smile on his face, just full of encouragement and cheerfulness, and uh, genuinely really exemplifies, uh, I think, what a, what a Christian gentleman uh, is and should be. And so uh, Leo is going to share, he's got some amazing stories, okay? And I know you can't tell them all, but we want to hear a little bit about, uh, take, the whole day. take the whole day, amen. But uh, we want to hear a little bit about uh, how God has worked in your life, Leo. So get us started here. By the way, I want to introduce Leo to you. As you don't know, Leo is, is an ordained minister in the Adventist church and uh, served for many years as a minister and also an administrator in our church. And for those who don't know, our church is organized uh, globally. So you have the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists that covers the entire global field because Jesus said, go into all the world, right? So we've organized globally so we can fulfill that mission of going into all the world. And that's known as the General Conference. And then we have 14, am I right? 14 divisions of the General Conference, of which we are the North America division. And then you got all the way down here to the local level. And Leo served for many years at the General Conference and you were a vice president, right, at the general conference. Director. Youth director, Pathfinder director, a lot of things. And so Leo is, uh, is known throughout the world in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. If you mention Leo Ranzlin, a lot of people know you for your many years of service. So, and you've traveled a lot and had a lot of experiences. So Leo, tell us, how did you get started? How, how did your life get started? How, how did you come into the faith? Can I just say something? You sure that? can. Anything you want, brother. I just want to say thanks for those of you who have prayed. Sandra pray. It was just so comforting. You have no idea what that means. And I have you also in my prayers, okay? Well, uh, this is the book that's the GPS of my life. Do not believe the date, 1950. That was the first time I saw a Bible. And I must say this, that uh, Pastor Blake, you know, my father was a race driver. He raced in the southern part of Brazil. He had a 1940 Ford, took second place. 1,500 miles, and in 1948, a lady gave him a Bible. And uh, he had another race in my home state. He took second place again, all in second place. <laughs> and uh, when he came back, he started looking at this Bible. And I was amazed to see the change in my family because our family was about ready to be destroyed completely. Mm. There was no hope, and I knew that. You know, I'm the older of seven brothers, one sister, and uh, that changed his life completely. I could not believe it. As I mentioned, one of the classes one day I was going to play soccer and going to the cinema. And my dad said, Lee, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to go to the cinema and I'm going to play some soccer. Instead of playing so much soccer and going to the movie, you should read this book. Wow, that was something that really struck me. I never will forget that. Well, then, making a long story short, we became Christians, Seventh-day Adventist Christians. And I went to our school, 1949. So you can see that uh, because of that, this book made part of my life. I would read on Sabbath afternoon 60 to 70 chapters. I don't know how many times I read this. This is second or third binding because, uh, you know, it's so precious to me. And when I made the third binding, I need to put Bible, uh, all the Bible studies here that you have all the way to the 28 uh, doctors and so on. So, Pastor Blake, that was the start and how this book changed my life, my ministry, 
And not only that, I want you to know that. It helped with my schoolwork. You know, my mind. This power of this book. This power of this book. Amen. It changed not only my life, changed my, my family. And here I am now, still retired. <laughs> Amen. And you're still doing ministry. Well. I told Leo... I don't want to get, I shouldn't say your age, but uh, the Lord has blessed you with years, 87, 87. And I said, first of all, I hope I get to 87. <laughs> Amen. We'll give you that. Thank you. Now I expect the Lord to come way before at that Amen. time. Amen. 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 We do. Amen. But if, if, you know, if he doesn't, I get to 87, I'll just be happy. And if I'm still going as strong as Leo, Amen. wow, that's impressive. Well, you know, the other thing was, uh, I wanted to share this. And, uh, you know, every time I get up, this is something I've been doing for years. I kneel and pray. Oh, so you're too sleepy. I don't care. Just say thank you for life. Amen? Amen? Every time I leave my house, I pray. And this is the book that I carry with me in all my trips. As you know, I've been all over the world. I've been to Africa about three times. And I carry this book here with me and Steps to Christ. These are the two. I have read them so many times. I read it in Spanish because I can speak Spanish. I read it in English because I can preach in English, I hope. And in my language, in Portuguese. So I have read the Bible in all these three languages so that I don't forget them. Well, anyway, uh, one of the great experiences that I had is as I always read the Bible in the airplanes. So I open the Bible and start reading, especially if it's a night flight. I'll be reading my Bible. And you won't believe the experience I had. Oh, that's a wonderful book you're reading. Oh, in my church we have this also. And, and, and by the way, somebody even gave me some money because you read a verse of my Bible. <laughs> he gave me some money. The Lord impressed me to give you some money. I said, well, I'm going to read my Bible more often. <laughs> In all the airplanes. But the one that I really want to share with you, Blake, is I told you, the class here knows. I was flying from Nairobi to New York. I've been to Africa about three times. Kenya is a beautiful country. And uh, it was a nice flight. See, if you want to go to Brazil, you had to go first to New York, then get a flight here to go down to Brazil. There was not a direct flight at that time going from Africa, unless you're in Johannesburg, then you can go to Rio. Well, anyway, I opened my Bible, and I started reading it, and uh, I always pray, because you never know what's going to happen. And every time when the plane lands, I say, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you so much for bringing me here again. Well, anyway, I started reading the Bible. I had my prayers because it was going to be a long flight. And this gentleman just sat right beside me. And he was impressed. Oh, I see you're reading your Bible. I said, yes, I do that in every flight. Uh, and you'll be praying. And I said, uh, who are you? I said, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist minister, and I'm going back home to America. Well, but I'm originally from Brazil. You must be kidding. I'm from Brazil also, he said. Well, of course, you know, when you met someone like that, you embrace. By the way, he was a Protestant minister. And, well, I don't have to tell you, we spent the whole night talking. We prayed. We talked. And uh, when we got to New York, I said uh, he was going on furlough from uh, Nairobi to New York. Then he could not know how long he was going okay. to spend his time. So he was a missionary in Africa. He was a missionary was in furlough. Africa. Gotcha. A Protestant denomination. Okay. Well, we had prayer. We talked about the Bible the whole night. I didn't sleep at all that night. When I got to New York, I said, uh, as we said goodbye, the big, big bear hug that we do not usually, and I told him this. Why should you have half of the truth when you could have the whole truth? He said, that stuck in his mind. Went back to Brazil. He looked for an Adventist pastor. Um, well, to make a long story short, this man became a Seventh-day Adventist. And uh, on the 90s, it was my privilege to go to Brazil again. It was the celebration of the very first baptism, a long time ago. And I don't know if you know, it was the Germans that brought the truth to Brazil, and then came the Americans later on. And so here was the centennial of the very first baptism. And they invited me to be the speaker for that. Okay, the place was absolutely packed in the state of Santa Catarina, mm -hmm. and where I grew up when I was a young man. And uh, after I finished my sermon, I was standing there, a lot of people coming to say hello, and 
And this man say, sir, do you remember me? I say, give me a hint. <laughs> you know, just like pathfinders or young people today, they say, do you remember me? Now they are pastors, they are doctors, you know, they have grown up. And I said, give me a hint. He said, flight from Nairobi to New York. When I said that, I just about jumped to the ceiling. <laughs> it was just the most wonderful experience. Yes, you know that? That's amazing. As a result of that encounter with you, going back home, I just had to search for this new truth, for things that we discussed on the airplane. I took Bible studies, you may remember the name, Josino Campos. I took Bible studies from the person who had the first prayer in my house, a minister had a first prayer in my house. I went Bible study with him. I studied the Bible with him. And he says, I was too old to become a Seventh-day Adventist minister. So I want you to know, Pastor Ransman, that I am a faithful elder, head elder in my church. Amen. And this came from you, shared with him the Sabbath message exactly. as you were on the exactly. airplane. And yes. then he was stimulated enough to study yes. that yes. Yes. and then accepted that and then and changed the trajectory of his life and ministry. That's why I was so excited when you start getting the people here to study the Bible. Amen. Because uh, this is the book that you need to read every day. Amen. Every day. My wife and I are reading the Bible, this time a devotional in Portuguese. I don't think you know this, but they have made a new devotional with all the people that have written devotional through the ages. Because I don't think you know, two, time, two persons uh, write. The third one is always an Ellen G. White one. So since 1953, there's four or five pages from all those people, including Elder Pearson, Amen. Elder Mark Finley, all these great leaders. They're all there. So we're reading that. And then the Desire of Ages and, of course, this book. Good book. Every day. So Amen. I was so excited That's powerful. that I wrote to the Southern Tidings about this. <laughs> I hope you read the article that is going to come up. What's happened in this church? Hmm. To go back to the Bible. We used to be the best people. We took uh, winning many, many contests. People that knew the Bible. Amen. Seventh-day Adventists. So stick with the Bible all your life because that's the thing you need to know. There's no better book than this. Amen. Just to mention one thing about this book. The Hittites. Did you know that the Encyclopedia Britannica said that this was a no good? You know, it doesn't exist. The Encyclopedia Britannica, the first edition, said this is not right. This uh, civilization does not exist. Hmm. And did you know the archaeology, you know what happened? Archaeology showed that the Hittite was a great, great civilization. And the second edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, they had to re change. They changed everything. Because this is the true thing, the Bible. Amen. 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 So don't believe in the Encyclopedia Britannica. I read on this one here. The Bible, that's right. Because they change, that doesn't. They change completely. They change yes. completely. That's, yes. a, that's an amazing story. Amen. Amen. And it just shows just, just the power of simple ministry. Exactly. You're reading, you're, I mean, this is how simple it is. What I always try to communicate is this is very simple. You read the word yes. and you share with others yes. the word yes. and God will take it from there. Don't feel yes. like you have to make these things happen. You didn't make that happen. No. You just read the word, shared the word, yes. and then the Holy Spirit watered that seed yes. and then look at the, the what, what, what became of that. Amen. 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 Thank yes. you so much for sharing, Leo. That's, That's an blessing. amazing story. Thank, Thank you, you again for your prayers. And Amen. Sandy. Sandra, really appreciate that today. Amen. Thank you. Hey, stay up here. We'll have a prayer with you real quick. Leo. Hold on, okay? Let's have a prayer. Father, I just thank you for the way you've worked in uh, Pastor Leo's life and the way you work in our lives as well, Father. And Father, help us to be faithful, Lord, to not miss these divine appointments that you have. Father, first of all, the divine appointment you have with us is every day to spend time with you, reading your word. Amen. And then we're prepared for the other divine appointments you have with us and others, O oh Lord. And so, Father, thank you for this inspirational story and this inspirational life. Please bless Pastor Leo, bless his dear wife, Lucilla. Be with them both, we pray, and we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Leo. Thank you for sharing. God bless you. Isn't that a good story? Oh, and he's got others, I'm telling you. We could just go on and on and tell all kinds of, all kinds of good stories that Leo has. So uh, am I live here, guys? Well, we'll get this going in a second. I'm going to show you a video first, all right? So hope that you, you get where we're going with this, and that is the attempt here is to, 
I don't know if inspire is the right word or because ultimately God's got to inspire you. I mean, I, I don't feel like it's my job to motivate you. If, if, if the son of God coming to planet earth and dying on a cross for your sins and being resurrected again and ascending into heaven and coming back soon doesn't motivate you, I, I don't know what I can offer, okay? But it is to somehow, you know, kind of break through because... It says in, in, in the story that, that they covered in the, in the children's story there, you know, the prodigal son in Luke chapter 16, it says, when he came to himself, it uses that phrase there. When he's in the pig pen, you know, obviously he said, dad, give me the inheritance and he's off doing his own thing and, and he is clueless, all right? But then he ends up in a pig pen and it says, when he came to himself, he realized he is in a pig pen. I just hope that all of us can come to ourselves, can come to our senses and to think clearly and move beyond this veil that Satan has put on the eyes of this world. That means you and me. We live in this world. But the Bible says that if anyone turns to God, the veil is lifted. We need to see clearly, brothers and sisters. Being religious is not what God wants. There's there's a world full of religious people, okay? Jesus came into a world that was full of religious people. In fact, he came to the most religious people on planet earth. They were up to the hilt in religion. But they killed God. Mercy. I'm glad we're not deceived like them, right? I mean, let's be real, okay? Why didn't they get it? I'm going to tell you why I think. Here's my working theory. Because they had systematized the truth. They had the truth. They were the people that had the truth, okay? Like they were the right church, so to speak. But they had traditions and, and, and the teachings of rabbis and leaders, and, and they had so systematized things and put it into a box that when the one who gave all that to them showed up, he was a foreign and strange thing to them. You see what I'm saying? They were full of religion. Paul even says, I bear them witness, they have a zeal for God but it is not in accordance with knowledge, all right? So it's good to have zeal and not be lukewarm and just, eh, whatever, apathetic. We need to be zealous, but that zeal also needs to be informed zeal and not informed in religion, okay? It needs to be informed by God. And frankly, I really don't know of any other way or any better way to do this than to take the book that God has given us and to read it for ourselves. Not just read a lesson plan that tells us what it's supposed to say, or not just listen to a sermon about the word, or read a book about it, but to actually read it. You see what I'm saying? Read it. And I think if the Jews had been able to do that at the time of Christ, I think a lot less people would have been led astray. I think they would have had clearer perceptions if they had been reading and thinking for themselves. Okay? Amen? So that's why I keep appealing to this so often here. I'm glad you're here. I'll share a message this morning. But at the end of the day, you read through this book one time, Thoughtfully, you thoughtfully read through this book, okay? Which means you're just taking time to really think about what's there, okay? It will be worth more than 50 years of listening to sermons. I guarantee you that. Now, the sermon thing is good too. You'll get some teaching and all that. But if you had one or the other laid on the table, thoughtfully and carefully reading through this book once will give you more than that. And the good news is you can read through it again. 
and then again. And you can still get the sermons too. It's like an all-for-one deal, okay? So, hey, let's do this, all right? Now, I hope you're convicted. But the rich young ruler was convicted too, okay? But he went away sad because he wouldn't pay the price that was required to follow Jesus. Don't just be convicted. Do what he says to do. And the price that is required in this is so minimal. Jesus said to the rich young ruler, sell what you have, give to the poor, and follow me. Mercy. Jesus didn't mess around. I'm just saying, take time to read the Bible each day and see what he says and go with that, all right? So don't just be convicted. Be converted, amen? And let's read it. And I promise you, the Lord will take it from there. If you just take that time with him each day, he will take it from there, and it will be a beautiful journey with your creator. So we are currently in our reading in 1 Timothy, which is six chapters. These are the pastoral epistles, what they call these. We're in 1 Timothy, and then we're going to read 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to show you the video here on 2 Timothy chapter 1. These Bible Project videos are a good resource. They are not infallible. They are not perfect. Neither am I, neither are you. This is God's perfect word to us, okay? But uh, these videos are helpful to set context. Because as we read the Bible, we want to understand that it was written to a people within a certain context. And as we understand that, then we understand it better and can apply this to our lives. And instead of showing the video on 1 Timothy, I'm actually going to show the one on 2 Timothy. Because that was Paul's last letter he ever wrote. His last epistle that he ever wrote. Now imagine if you're a lifelong preacher like Paul and it's the last sermon, right? You know it's going to be a good one, right? He's going to give it all on this one. So this is his last epistle. It's a beautiful epistle. It's just four chapters, all right? They're going to break it down for us. And I hope today, as Sandra said, she read 1 Timothy chapter 1. I hope if you're not reading, hey, pick it up today. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and start with us. And we finish, we'll just, we'll just loop it on back and start over again, okay? So don't worry if you miss stuff or whatever. We'll cover it again. So just jump in today and start reading. All right, let's hit it. 2 Timothy yeah, 2 Timothy 1 through 4. I'll cover this right now, then we'll get up and we'll have a little short reflection on Scripture. Paul's second letter to Timothy. This is Paul's final and most personal letter. He wrote it from yet another time in prison, and it's addressed to Paul's dear co-worker and protege, the young Timothy. Now, we don't know how much time exactly has passed since he wrote 1 Timothy, but we can see that Paul's situation has changed and for the worse. He's imprisoned in Rome, which could refer to his time under house arrest that was mentioned in Acts chapter 28, or it could be that he was released from that imprisonment, had another long season of ministry, and then was arrested again in Troas. Either way, Paul says he's in the middle of his court trial now, and it is not going well. He's pretty sure he's not going to survive this one. And so out of this very dark situation, Paul appeals to Timothy, who it seems is still on assignment in Ephesus. He asked Timothy to come be with him in prison so Paul can pass on to him the church planting mission he started. The letter's design is pretty simple. There are two large sections where Paul challenges Timothy. First, to accept his calling as a leader, and then, before he comes to Paul, to deal with the corrupt teachers that are still causing problems in Ephesus. After this, Paul concludes the letter. So Paul begins by thanking God for Timothy and his family, specifically for his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. They immersed the young Timothy in the story of the Old Testament scriptures. They instilled in him a deep faith in the Messiah Jesus. And so because of that firm faith, Paul offers his first challenge to Timothy. He calls him to reject any temptation to be ashamed of the good news about Jesus or of Paul who's suffering in prison for announcing that good news. Now, the reason Paul needs to emphasize this is the negative stigma that he gained by his frequent times in prison. It made many of Paul's co-workers, in fact, doubt his calling as an apostle. He mentions two guys, Fugelis and Hermogenes. They deserted Paul because they were ashamed of being associated with Paul, who was an accused criminal now. So Paul asked Timothy to reject any fear of shame and to come see him. Now, 
Paul knows that this is a costly request. It could put Timothy at risk. And so he reminds Timothy that Jesus' grace is a source of power, which is really important. You're going to need it because following Jesus is not easy. It requires everything that you have. Paul likens following Jesus to enrolling as a soldier who's striving to please their commanding officer. Or it's like an athlete who's training their body for a competition. Or it's like a hard-working, dedicated farmer. All three of these metaphors involve a person who's committed to something bigger than themselves and who's willing to sacrifice and endure challenges to accomplish a greater goal. And of course, the highest example of this is Jesus himself. Because of his commitment to the Father, he suffered crucifixion by the Romans. And similarly, Paul himself is now suffering in a Roman prison. Hardship and sacrifice are inherent to the Christian life. And this is why Jesus' resurrection is the foundation of Christian hope. Or as Paul puts it in a short and very powerful poem, If we died with him, then we will live with him. If we endure, then we will reign with him. If we deny him, then he will deny us. If we are unfaithful, he will remain faithful, for he's unable to deny his own nature. God's love for our world has opened up a new hope through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so for those who will take the risk of trusting and following Jesus, God promises vindication and life. For those who reject him, God will honor that decision and do the same. But people's faithlessness will never compel God to abandon his faithfulness. And so Paul calls Timothy to faithfulness, knowing that it may come with a cost. Paul moves into the second half of the letter, calling Timothy to confront the corrupt teachers in Ephesus before he comes to Rome. Their teaching is spreading in the Ephesian church like a cancer. They've targeted and corrupted a number of influential women in the church. These are likely the wealthy women that Paul had to deal with in his first letter to Timothy. He doesn't offer much detail about the teacher's bad theology. Timothy already knows about it. But he does give us one hint. He says, they teach that the resurrection has already taken place. Now, we don't know if the teachers are following a Greek philosophical rejection of the whole idea of bodily resurrection, and they think it's only really about spiritual experience. Or it could be that they've simply distorted Paul's teaching about the resurrection life that begins now through the power of the Spirit. Either way, the problem is that they've abandoned the robust future hope of resurrection and of new creation, and they've embraced instead a private, hyper-spiritualized Christianity that is disconnected from day-to-day -day life. And so Paul calls Timothy to raise up faithful leaders who are going to teach the real good news about Jesus. They should avoid senseless arguments that result from debating the teachers. In contrast, Timothy and his leadership team are to keep the main thing the main thing. They should focus on the core storyline and message of the scriptures, which in Paul's day meant primarily the Old Testament. These scriptures, Paul says, are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith in the Messiah, Jesus. He's saying the whole point of the scriptures is to tell you a unified story that leads to Jesus and that has wisdom to offer the whole world. Then Paul talks about scripture's nature and purpose. He says all scripture is divinely breathed, literally God-spirited. It's a reference to the Spirit's role in guiding the biblical authors so that what they wrote is what God wanted his people to hear. And God speaks to his people in the scriptures for a very practical purpose. He says they're useful for teaching, telling me things I didn't know before. They're useful for challenging, getting in my face about the things I say I believe but I don't actually live consistently with. They're useful for correcting me, exposing my messed up ways of thinking and behaving, and they're useful for training me in righteousness, showing me a new way to be truly human. And this is all so that God's people will be prepared for doing good. Paul closes the letter by reminding Timothy that he's probably not going to make it out of prison alive. So he asks Timothy to come as soon as possible, before winter. He doesn't want to freeze in his cell, and so he's going to need his heavy coat that he had to leave behind. And also, could Timothy please bring those personal documents that he left in Troas, likely when he got arrested? He also mentions Alexander, who's an especially dangerous man that Timothy should avoid. He's probably responsible for Paul's most recent arrest. Paul concludes by mentioning how nearly everyone's abandoned him in prison, and his only source of comfort now is the personal presence of Jesus, who stands with him and will deliver him even if he dies. And so the letter ends. 
The letter of 2 Timothy stands as a reminder that Paul's very influential life and mission were marked by persistent challenge and suffering and struggle. Following Jesus involves risk and sacrifice. It means inviting tension and discomfort into your life. And these things are not a sign of Jesus' absence. Rather, as Paul discovered with generations of Christians after him, that precisely in those dark and difficult moments, Jesus' love and faithfulness can become the most tangible and real. And that's what 2 Timothy, Paul's final letter, is all about. All right, well, you got seven chapters ahead of you this week. All right, 1 Timothy, and then beginning of 2 Timothy chapter 1. And you can supplement, I'll be honest with you, you start doing this, I'm going to guarantee you're going to want more than just one chapter. It's like sitting down for a meal and, and they just give you, you know, like some kind of, I don't know, some kind of little person portion, you know. <laughs> you want to load that plate up a little bit. So I supplement with reading in the Old Testament, Psalms, Proverbs, finishing up the book of Job, you know, so if you really want to give it about 20 minutes a day of reading, you can read one chapter along with us and add about two or three um, others in from somewhere else. You can any other book you want. Old Testament's good. And uh, I promise you, God's going to bless. All right. Now I'm going to give just a, a short reflection here. OK, this isn't going to be a long sermon because there's no need for it. I want you to get the sermon yourself from the Holy Spirit at home. All right. That's the goal of this. But. I'll share something that I got this last week in our, uh, our reading. And actually, I got this right over here, Tuesday morning at 6.30 a.m. when we were um, having our breakfast with Jesus. And I was so impacted by this verse, and we journaled on it. And I told the group, because we have a discussion. We have different tables, and we'll read for 20 minutes, then we'll journal for 20 minutes. And if you show up, I'll give you a journal, and we'll show you how to do this, all right? It'll transform your devotional life, I promise, all right? I'm also going to do Platform 25 next week. Me and Aubrey just talked about that. So next Friday, uh, Platform 25, whatever time it is, I guess 7, some, somewhere in there. And uh, I'll be sharing this there, how to study the Bible and get something out of it. So show on up. And if you do, I'll give you a, uh, a Bible study tool for free if you promise to use it. All right. And so I was doing this there on Tuesday and I told him, man, I think I just wrote my sermon. Man, this really was impactful. So this is a verse that I read years ago, had a big impact on me. And God just brought it home so strongly again to me this week. I love this verse and, and the truth that is contained in it. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. This is Paul writing. He's ending his epistle to them. And he says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. Sanctify just means like made holy, right? That's all. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept. What's that next word, y'all? Blameless. That sounds good, right? sanctified and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and you're going to do this. Who's going to do it? He will do it. Isn't that a powerful promise? He says, sanctify you through and through, blameless at the second coming. The one who called you to this is faithful, and he is going to do this. Isn't that awesome news? He's going to do this. There's a lot. This is actually a pretty common theme in, in Paul's writings. Here's another one here in Philippians 1, verses 5 and 6. He says, in all my prayers for all of you, writing to the Philippians there, a church he planted. You can read about it in Acts 16, I think. He says, I always pray with joy, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to what? to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Same kind of theme, right? I started it. I'm going to bring this thing through to completion. Here's another one, Jude 24. It's like a doxology at the end of Jude. Jude's just one chapter, so it's just, there's just verses. Jude verse 24. He says, Now all glory to God, who is able to keep you from falling away. That word is apostia in the Greek, where we get the word apostasy, or like falling away, turning away from God. It says God is able to keep you from falling away and to bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. Isn't that awesome? Who's going to do it here? God's going to do it, right? All right, here's another one. Hebrews chapter 12, 1 and 2 says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us, 
There's different ways to run, isn't there? If someone is, uh, if your house is burning down and you're running outside of it, are you running with patience, yes or no? No, I don't think I'm too patient. I think that's more of a sprint. <laughs> if somebody says, hey, I need you to run 50 miles, you think I'm going to sprint? No. I'm going to run with extraordinary patience if I have to run 50 miles, right? You know, it's a marathon, right? This Christian walk is a marathon, not a sprint. Let us run with patience the race that is set out before us looking unto Jesus the what and what author is he also going to wrap this thing up for us he's the author he put it all together it's his plan not ours he's the author and the finisher of our faith now question who's going to see the work to completion God he will finish the good work he's begun in you. He who calls you is faithful. He will do it. All right? Second question. Do you and I have a part to play in this? Yeah. Obviously so, right? I mean, Paul, he doesn't say, so just sit on that cart and relax. He actually says we're to do something. Run with patience. The race set is set out before us. So y'all know me. I like to get charts and break things down, all right? So let's break this verse down a little bit. What are we to do? We're to run. How are we to do it? With patience. What are we to do while we're running with patience? Man, keep your eyes on the guide. If you're running with patience, but your eyes on on the guide, you can find yourself off the trail. When I lived out west, we did a lot of hiking, and you can be having a good old time hiking and talking away, and next thing you know, this trail doesn't look like a trail anymore. I think I'm out in the boonies somewhere, and I've gotten off the trail. You lived out west, Russell, you know that, that's how it is, right? You get off that trail, and all of a sudden you realize, I don't see a trail, it all looks the same. What do you do if you get off the trail? What do you do, Russell? You turn around and go back. You don't, you don't keep going. You don't sit around and scream for help, right? And nobody out there. That's why there's no trail, right? You turn around and go back and you find the trail. But if you keep your eyes looking, you don't get off the trail, okay? Satan's got all kinds of little false trails for us to go down that he'll try to lure you down. This is why we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. And the way we do that Hint, hint, you keep your eyes in this, right? You stay in this daily, daily. That daily study in the Word is kind of like that GPS that keeps you guided on the trail. If you're not doing that, it's easy to think you're on the trail and then all of a sudden find out, you know what, I actually don't think I'm on the trail. This trail sort of disappeared somewhere along the way and all I see is rocks and dust, all right? But if we're kind of keeping on looking, you stay on that trail, and this is what will guide you. One of my favorite verses, it's in, let me see, I didn't put this in the sermon. It's just one I memorized years ago, and I find that I'm kind of forgetting things I remembered. Is that normal with age? Yeah, I've heard, yeah. It's, uh, it's Isaiah. It's in Isaiah. I know it's in Isaiah, and I think it's a verse 8 in Isaiah, but I can't remember. Somebody Google this for me, all right? I think it's 31.8, but tell me if I'm wrong. I may be wrong. Somebody Google it and please correct me publicly in front of everybody. But I'm asking you to do it, all right? Because I, I want to remember if I got this right. It says, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. Y'all familiar with that verse? Somebody Google that. By the way, Bible concordances are unnecessary today. Google put them all out of business. You just need to go to Google and if you want to know where a verse is, just type in like what you remember of the verse and Google. And, and if you have a book, maybe if you don't have a book, if you just type that in, Google will find it and you'll see where the reference is and you can look it up. It's a great tool. 3021. All right, I was off. I was in the, I was in the ballpark, but I'm a little off the trail. Isaiah 3021. Your ears shall hear a word behind you that says, this is the way, walk in it whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. Now, I did a study on that years ago because I was really studying like how to know God's will. How do I know what God wants me to do? And I was looking at all the verses I could find on knowing God's will and that was one that came up. 
And I wanted to say, what does that mean, turn to the right hand or turn to the left? I, from my Bible reading, I knew that that was used in Scripture. I could remember the, reading that phrase before. And so I did a word search. You could do these things online. Like you can, you know, Bible, I think it's BibleGateway.com. There's these tools online. And you can just start typing in phrases, and it'll show you our words, and it'll start showing you where these things turn up in Scripture. And so I looked that up, left or right, you know, and I looked all this, and it's, used, it's never used in the New Testament, but it's used multiple times in the Old Testament. And in every case, as I looked at each verse that said, you know, turning to the right hand or the left hand, the, the implication to me seemed to be that someone was getting off the trail, all right, getting off the path they had for him. Like it'll mention certain kings in Judah, and it'll say, he never turned from the Lord to the right hand or to the left hand, but he followed the Lord all the days of his life, okay? So that really filled that verse in Isaiah more for me when it said, your ears will hear a word behind you saying, this is the way walk in it whenever you're getting off the trail, whenever you're turning to the right hand or to the left hand. And so God will guide us, but he needs to be, he speaks in a still small voice. He doesn't get a megaphone and yell at us, all right? And so for us to hear a still small voice, we have to settle our minds down and be quiet and listen. Like the verse says, be still and know that I am God, all right? I love this verse here. It's one of my favorites. It's one I found just reading the Bible. Never heard anybody preach on it except me. I preach on it all the time. At least every three, three to six months I bring this verse in because I just like it so much. Maybe you've heard other people share. I've never heard anybody share it. So if I just sat around and waited on a preacher to show up with it, I'd be out of luck. I found this reading the Bible. This is powerful. Ezekiel 36, he says, I will give you. But notice who will give it to us. It's not us generating this stuff. If you're not interested in spiritual things, yeah, none of us are naturally. We're interested in the flesh. But the flesh leads to death, Scripture says. The Spirit gives life. So we have to be converted. And as we're converted, this is what he does for us. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. This is tangible. You can know when this has happened. We don't have to question whether God exists or not. You know, there's all these debates over the existence of God. I mean, that, that's interesting on a certain level. I mean, that, there's a need for good apologetics and so on. But at the end of the day, I know Charles here. I don't have to debate with you if Charles exists because I know him, right? If you know God and he's transformed you, that ends the debate, right? And he'll do this. This is totally objective reality. He says, I will give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit within you. I will remove from your heart of stone. Remove from you your heart of stone. I'll give you a heart of flesh. That means a soft, a tender heart. I had a lady say to me a few weeks back, no, no, no one here, somebody I just met through the way, and she was saying, I, I just want a softer heart, you know, toward my kids. I realized, she realized how hard-hearted she had been toward her kids. And she said her parents had been that way toward her. Well, the good news is God will give her a soft heart. Amen. Amen. He will do it for all of us. We just got to do our part. He's going to do what he's going to do his part. We just have to do our part. And our part is very simple. And a lady said this to me when I was in my convert, I, I got converted. When I was 23 years old and there was a coworker, a lady I worked with that God used as a, to disciple me. I didn't know what that was. I didn't know what it was called at the time, but she was essentially discipling me. She was, you know, she, she had a good solid walk with Christ and, and I developed a friendship with her, and then she kind of taught me about God and brought me to the church and everything, right? That was a discipleship. She made a statement to me, and I've never forgot this statement because it was one of those moments of, wow, that was so clear and so helpful. She said, Blake, God will do everything for you except make the decision. That's your part. You make the decision, he'll do all the other stuff, okay? God is not going to grab you by the, by the nap of the neck and shove you down in the chair and open a Bible before you and say, yeah, you read this right now or you're in trouble. He's not going to do that. He won't make the decision for you. That's your part. 
You're either going to decide to sleep in or you're going to decide to get up and read the Bible. You're either going to decide to veg on Netflix or you're going to decide to spend time and get to know the Lord. You're going to decide to, decide to get up and, and come and worship God on Sabbath morning. Or you're going to go decide to do something else. He won't make the decision for you. That's your part. But he will empower your decisions. As you make the right choices, then he will breathe his power into you. And all of this stuff you're reading right here will be fulfilled in your life. Now, what I just said is either true or it's false. What is the one way you can know if that's true or if that's false? Try it. Just try it, okay? Amen. Jesus said in John 14, 21, that he who has my commandments and keeps them, that's the one who loves me. Anything short of that, guys, and we're just deceiving ourselves, okay? He says, if you have my commandments and keeps them, keep them, that's the one who loves me, and he says, I'll love him and manifest myself to him, all right? That's either true or false. Jesus said, if you follow what he says, he will manifest himself to you. So try it out and see. I will put my spirit in you. I will move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Man. All right, Philippians 2, 12 and 13, last verse. Therefore, my dear friends, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That means take it very serious, okay? This is not a joke. This is, I, I'm not trying to present some hobby to you, like maybe you should be religious. You know, some people like to bass fish and some people like to church. Have you ever considered churching? Churching's kind of lame, frankly. Eh, churching's okay. Churching is lame without God. With God, it's great. I'm not presenting churching. This is not a hobby. This is very serious stuff. Okay? Two destinies all of us can go. So he says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you. I love this. To will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. He makes us want to do it, and then he empowers us to do it. But what's the one thing he can't do? For, he can even make you want to do it. That's pretty cool, right? Amen. I don't like olives. I don't understand people that do. My, my family all like olives. I don't get it. I sincerely don't. I, I, how, I, I don't know. Yeah, they're not good, but okay. Yeah, they, my kids here, they're trying to convince me now. This is the first time we've had this conversation. I just simply don't get it, okay? I can't relate to it. God will make you want to do what is good. The equivalent of liking olives if you don't, okay? Because if, if the things of God are distasteful to us, he will help us with that. He will help us. He, it says he's given to everyone a measure of faith, a measure of faith, okay? You don't need a dump truck load of faith to get started. He's given you a measure of faith. You just need to exercise the mustard seed measure that he's given you, right? Amen? And I'm trying to make it as simple as I can. I'm saying, look, just, just read one little chapter a day and see what he does from there, all right? That's it. As we read the word, that's keeping our eyes on Jesus. As we do what it says, that's running the race. And as we stay with it, that's patience. This is us working out our salvation with fear and trembling because it is God working in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Very, very simple. Very, very effective. Let's pray. Thank you so much, God, 
for caring about us, for sending us the scriptures, for sending us Jesus, for sending the Holy Spirit, for sending the church, Father. What more could you have done for our salvation, Lord? Oh God, may we want to do what is right and have your power to do it. And if we stumble along the way, which we will, help us just get back up and just keep running that race with patience and perseverance, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. As we read 1 Timothy this week and 2 Timothy, may you reveal yourself to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, brothers and sisters. We will dismiss by rose. We have Brother Mike here in the front and one of our deacons there in the back. Is that Arnold or Larry? One of those guys will dismiss, okay? God bless you. Have a great Sabbath. Remember, read the word this week. Jesus has got something to say to you.